Hello, everyone. Glory to Jesus Christ. Welcome to another lesson in our Becoming Byzantine series. This is lesson 34. Uh, today, we're going to be looking at the Christian view of the world, and the church is the model of human community. So we're in Christ our Pascha, paragraphs 911 through 926, so hopefully a, a short lesson today, uh, but good to be with everyone again. And as always, let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O Heavenly King, Comforter, Spirit of Truth, present in all places and filling all things, the treasury of blessings and the giver of life, come and dwell within us, cleanse us of all stain, and save our souls, O Good One. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good to be with everyone again. Um, we're making a bit of a transition into the final phase of the catechism. So we're, we're winding down quite quickly. And if you remember in the previous couple of lessons, we've been talking about the dignity of the human person, right? The dignity of the person at the beginning of life. Um, so we've tackled all those issues with, with contraception and kind of begin, beginning of life issues. And then we looked at the end of life and making those good moral and ethical uh, choices towards the, the end of human life. And now we're going to see how the church's teaching kind of expands out of the household, right, and begins to encompass society, right, our, our local community, our city, our state, our country, the world, etc. So that's what we're going to be looking at today. So the sanctity of life and, and the teaching, uh, the church's teaching on the sanctity of life spills over into society, right? Um, our care and concern, we have a natural care and concern for those in our household, right? Parents have a natural care and concern for their children, right? You might have a natural obligation to your neighbors, you know, the people who live next door to you or on your block, right? Uh, you might feel a, a great affinity for the city in which you live, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but all of that, right, all of those relationships are all rooted in the church's teaching on the dignity and value of the human person, right? I care about people in the house next to me, in the city next to me, in the state next to me, in the country next to me, precisely because the people, and they might be close to us, or they might be way far away. They might be in Africa, right? Um, but I care about those people because they're made in the image and likeness of God. Right. And so that's the root of the church's teaching in terms of how do we integrate and transform and work with all people in society? It's because of that, the, the, the church's teaching on the dignity of human life. Right. And we feel this most especially in the liturgy. Right. Um, the liturgical life of the church. Right? When we gather together as church on Sunday to celebrate the Eucharist, and, and Christ our Pascha 916 talks about this, but when the church gathers together, right, the church is the family of the baptized, right? So you have the domestic church, and then you have the church church, right? That's, that's the community of the baptized. When we gather together to receive the Eucharist, the reception of the Eucharist is not just about my relationship with Jesus. It certainly is that, but that's not the only dimension, right? Because we are never in isolation as a baptized person. We're always part of the communion of the church, right? And, th and that act of communion, of receiving the Holy Eucharist, it, it's, it, it build, it's, the, it's the moment of the realization and the actualization of our common union as church right now that reception of of the the holy eucharist is meant to provide us with the grace and strength that we need to grow in holiness but the cup of the lord always overflows right and it's meant to overflow in, outside of the walls of the church and in into society into so ah, society can't say that word society um it's meant to have an impact right our eucharistic celebration cannot be contained within the walls of the church 
it, it, it can't do it, right? Um, it's meant to spill outward. Um, you're meant to be transformed so that you're a better husband, a better, better mother, a better father, uh, a better, better coworker, a better boss. Uh, whatever your walk in life is, when you receive Holy Communion, you're supposed to be transformed and you in turn are supposed to transform secular society bit by bit, by your example, right? Where people look at you and, oh yeah, my boss is a Christian and I know it because he treats his employees like a Christian should treat employees, right? So that's, that's kind of what we're going to be discussing today um, is that transformation of society and it is very it is eucharistic centered absolutely um liturgy and philanthropia is the title of the slide fancy word but it means you see that the root for the word philanthropy right the giving and kind of the assistance of those in need right and this is what i was just talking about um in our worship, in our Eucharistic worship, we, we see this as, as Byzantine Catholics, especially during the Lenten season, because on Sunday we celebrate the liturgy of St. Basil. Um, it's also in, in St. John Chrysostom, but it's very, very um, pronounced in, in the anaphora of St. Basil, the Eucharistic prayer of St. Basil. Um, he makes an excellent point that the Eucharistic worship that we're going through um, is meant to turn the, the Christian community outward towards society. And St. Basil did this very well. Um, he has various petitions for our civil authorities, for marriages, for children, um, for those who have gone astray. Um, there's one particular pet petition that I love because it's so, it sticks out and it's so beautiful that the evil may become good that those who are evil may become good, right? That conversion of the individual, that conversion of society um, through the grace of Christ that's unleashed in the Eucharist um, is what St. Basil is, is driving at there. And it's really, really, it's a beautiful, it's a poignant petition, it really is. Um, and St. Basil did this on purpose. I, I, I might digress a bit into a little bit of the life of St. Basil, but he was, uh, we call him St. Basil the Great for a reason. Um, he had a great understanding of um, the centrality of the church, the centrality of the Eucharistic celebration, um, but then that there needed to be these layers of the church's activity, all rooted in the Eucharist, but, but these layers where he, he founded a, a place called the Basilidad, which was kind of a monastic community, like a semi-monastic community, um, but it also had a hospital attached to it. Um, it had a, a basically a soup kitchen attached to it. People knew that they could go to this place for physical and spiritual refreshment. Um, so St. Basil was really a pioneer in that, um, in connecting kind of the, the Eucharist to the church's social outreach um, for, the, for the care and concern of, of those who are less fortunate. So St. Basil certainly saw the petitions that he prayed during the Eucharist as an invitation to the metamorphosis of the congregation. So it begins with us, right? It, we're changed when we receive the Eucharist. But our change, our growth, our theosis turns and looks at our neighbor, looks at those on the doorstep of our churches, right? And it turns our care and concern to the poor, the sick, the weak, the, those who are powerless. Um, that's, that's the movement of the liturgy, right? The liturgy is this great ascent up the mountain of God, you know, and, and, and culminates in the reception of Holy Communion. But then when we come down the mountain, um, we're meant to change the world around us. And again, it's, it's not great change I'm talking about. I'm not, I'm not talking about uh, revolution or anything like that. What I'm talking about is that Christ should be seen in us by those whom we encounter and those whom we work with, right? And we are called to be Christ's to those around us. That's, that's the point. 
That's the point. And that's the only way for a society to change, I think, is by us becoming um, better mirrors by which to reflect the love of Christ on the world. So St. Basil certainly, certainly saw that. All right. Let's talk about the common good. Uh, the Catechism mentions the common good, um, but I'm going to go straight to the, the, the source document that gives us a good definition. Um, so this is from Vatican II, uh, the document Gaudium et Spes. By the common good is to be understood the sum total of social conditions which allow people either as groups or as individuals to reach their, their fulfillment more fully and more easily. Really what the common good, to make it very, very simple, um, what the common good is all about is that even though we're individuals, even though it's me and you and my family, we're all individual persons, um, no, one is, no one ever lives in isolation. No one is ever a, a, a radical individual. Um, we're all connected. We're all connected. We all have intimate connections with others in society. And so because human existence is so interconnected, the common good are those things which benefit the good of society, right? Um, and those are to be guarded. Those are to be encouraged, all right? Um, so concern for the common good, making sure that my neighbor has what he or she needs for fulfillment, especially spiritual fulfillment, but certainly physical fulfillment as well. So concern for the common good is a recognition of our shared humanity and our rootedness in the image and likeness of God. So to illustrate this a bit more, I've got this, this image here, and you, you probably recognize it. It's from the film, It's a Wonderful Life. And I love that film. It's so beautifully done because, of course, the, the main character, George Bailey, um, you know, at kind of the climax of the film, you know, he, he, he feels like a radical, isolated individual, right? His business is failing. He's got a warrant out for his arrest. He's being hunted down by the police. He, he feels like he doesn't have a friend in the world, right? And so he feels that loneliness, that anxiety, that, that isolation. Uh, and he's, he wants to jump off the bridge and end his life. And then Clarence shows up, right? And Clarence the angel is the character that shows him how integrated and how connected George Bailey's life is to everybody else in his community, right? Um, George Bailey is kind of, he's so ingrained right? Because his, his life has touched on so many others for the good, right? And that's what Clarence shows him. And he shows him that despite this, this, this hiccup in his life, he's had a wonderful life. That's the point of that movie, is to show that interconnected, interconnectedness between all of us in society and the good that we can do for one another. So that's the point. So hopefully that Think on that movie when you think about the common good. All right, to conclude our time today, uh, Christ our Pascha 921, 922 talks about the principles of solidarity and subsidiarity, right? So because of their communal aspect of human life, we urge one another on in holiness. Holy lives correspond to good citizenship and participation in political life. This is something that our, our modern American culture and our modern political system, they don't understand. Um, but really a holy person who is a member of society is a good citizen because they don't only concern themselves with themselves, but a holy person turns himself outward to look at the needs of others and to care for the needs of others. Um, a holy person recognizes the need to participate in community life, in community political life. So good Catholics are good citizens, is what I'm saying. Right? And an aspect of this is the, what's called the principle of solidarity. 
So the principle of solidarity also articulated in terms of friendship or social, social charity is a direct demand of, of human and Christian brotherhood. Okay. So that, that solidarity, that recognition, that mutual recognition of our shared humanity um, breaks down barriers. We recognize, uh, when we recognize the humanity of others, we are more apt to form those bonds of friendship and social charity for the building up of our communities. That, that's important, that's important. The principle of subsidiarity stems from our commitment to service. Um, the catechism uses the word diakonia from which we get the word deacon, um, but that, 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 uh, that service towards the community and our service, of course, it begins with those who are around us, but then it resonates outward. Um, our, our individual homes are kind of the epicenter of our service, but it radiates outward. Um, as our love in Christ grows as a family and as a church as well, those circles get ever wider to encompass more and more people. And that's, that's the point. That's the point. Um, we're, the kingdom of God is meant to spread right? And we spread the kingdom of God through service, right? Because Christ was a servant. Christ stooped to wash the feet of his disciples. Uh, we're called to do the same. Um, the principle of subsidiarity um, is a principle from Catholic social teaching. And basically what it means is we're called to take care of the problems of, uh, of a community at the, at the smallest and most direct level. So issues within the family are meant to be taken care of within the family. Um, they're not called, you know, my neighbor doesn't have anything to do with the education of my children, um, except remotely. Um, so you take care of things at the smallest level. Why? Because it's, it's the people who are intimately involved should be intimately involved in solving the problem, right? If you have a problem at the local level at the maybe something going on in your city well your city should take care of it um, it shouldn't be the county or the state right um, so really it's it's meant to involve the people in the solution um, at, at that smallest smallest level and I think this is just common sense um, but often it's neglected often it's overlooked because uh, you know government can be can be big right? Uh, big brother, right? Somebody who, you know, if, if government is too large, then they want to butt in and micromanage every portion of, of human life. And that's, that's destructive. That's destructive. And that does not, um, uh, that does not correspond to the Christian virtue of justice. Um, so hopefully that's helpful. All right, this was our, our nice beginning to taking a look at what we call Catholic social teaching. Uh, we'll keep talking a little bit more in lesson 35, and then we've got lesson 36, and that is it. So once again, I hope you're enjoying these uh, lectures and the Becoming Byzantine series. We're here to serve you. We're here to share the gospel of Christ with anyone who will listen. So thank you all very much for your attention, and we will see you in the next one. Glory to Jesus Christ.